to Stop Booking Around. I'm John Cronshaw and I'm joined today by a guest. Today we've got Laura Marconi Cox. Now, Laura and I have been friends for, I don't know how long would you say, 17 years, something like that. It's a long, long time. <laughs> and I think you're just starting to think about putting together your first book. Tell me a little bit about what has led you to this point. Um, well, I suppose I've, I've wanted to write for years and years, and I have tried before, but in a sort of um, that kind of way of just trying to, oh, I've got an idea, I'll just start writing. And of course, it just peters out and I got stuck and frustrated. Um, and that's sort of happened several times. There's usually sort of a two or three year gap between trying again. And this time I just came back to it because I felt like I really want a, a voice, really. There are things I want to share and and also explore for my own sake. But I was struggling to kind of find a route into it because something I've found often is, you know, there's plenty of writing manuals out there and they all tend to say the same thing of basically it's very competitive out there. Why bother writing if it's not going to be a bestseller? You may as well give up now, love. And I thought, well, I'm not going to even bother with that anymore. And then I thought, John's a writer. I'll speak to John. And here we are. <laughs> so, <laughs> what I thought is in, was interesting is um, getting my book thrown back at me in a way. Is uh, <laughs> <laughs> you reading it and having some stuff from it? And I think in the book I list a lot of different methods for actually putting together a novel. And, and you've picked a, a method actually that I've never tried before, which is the snowflake method. Because isn't it like you start off with doing POVs for each of your characters and then you build up profiles and then you kind of keep building up until you've basically written a skeleton and things like that? Uh, well, at the moment, I'm planning it out. So I read um, Stop Booking About, which is really, really useful, by the way. And I worked through some of the exercises in that, like, um, you know, what fears stand in your way of, of your writing and identifying what motivates you to write, what you want to do in the first place, that kind of thing. Um, and I also did that sort of idea gathering thing of listen to a, an essay, a short story and a poem every day. And I only did it for about a week, but it really, it sort of proved a point really. <laughs> and there was a lot of ideas. And one of what I've ended up wanting to write about was a complete tangent to one thing I read. It was a poem, I think, where uh, it was all based around one colour and memory around that colour. And then that got me thinking and I thought, hmm. Went off from that. So where I am now is I'm working through the snowflake story planning method, which I'm finding really useful. And where I am on that is a roundabout sort of writing a summary of the characters, really. And into that, I've brought in a sort of thing that I found online, which is where you kind of interview your main character or characters to find out a bit more about them and expand them. So I'm doing that with the main character at the moment and enjoying it. Do you know what genre it is? I'm sure there must be a genre for it. I'm not sure what it is, really. Um, <laughs> suppose, really, it, it's the kind of book I like to read where I can learn about... Uh, try to think how to describe it. You know, like sometimes you read something and it teaches you something a bit of, about yourself because it, it holds up a bit of a mirror in some way. Yeah. Uh, I like that kind of book. The central theme of the book really is exploring how we reduce each other to two dimensions. Even people we love and are very close to, we still see them as uh, maybe a role or a set of roles in our life. And it's sort of based around that idea, really. You start off with a single sentence, which is working on just summarising your idea in one sentence, which can change at any time. And then you take that sentence, you expand it into a paragraph, and then you expand that paragraph into a page. And you do the same with character summaries. It's quite methodical. It appealed to me because I was trying to think, well, when I'm working at my best, what am I doing? And at work, I'm incredibly efficient. I get a lot done. It's because I'm very methodical. I have a structured way of doing stuff. So I thought, OK, what if I apply that to writing? It is tedious in a way because you're really breaking down each stage into minute detail. It feels like I've got momentum going because it's little step by step. It's like, right, well, I can write a sentence right? and I can expand that into a paragraph. Of course I can. And so on and so on. So I think I'm going to see it through to the end because I think it get, it drills all the way down to having sort of a scene by scene structure mm. laid out and you expand that. But I think that appeals to me because potentially I think I'd end up sort of running out of steam when I was actually writing the thing. So, so far enjoying it. I think that that is 
an issue a lot of new writers get is I think a lot of people are resistant to this idea of structure and resistant to this idea of actually having something to work from. That is, you know, it's not a formula, but it's a kind of tried and tested way of doing things that has had success in the past. And it's like, no, no, I'm the creative one. I know exactly how this should be done. I'm a free spirit. Yeah. And then it fizzles out and it always fizzles yeah. out. And you blame yourself for that as well, yeah, yeah. For, for not being creative enough or something. There are people who can do it and more power to them, but <laughs> for the rest of us, you know. Yeah, the structures. And and it really resonated with me, actually, uh, what you wrote in Just uh, Stop Booking Around, which was yourself had resisted having a structure on anything for a long time and then sort of finally gave it a go and found out, actually, you can be creative within a structure because it's you've got a space to work in that way, really. Otherwise, you just... If the world's your oyster, where do you start? If you've actually put a bit of a framework in place for yourself, you can do whatever you like in that framework, then you, you're free. There's a book I read, I think it was at the end of last year, that was, it wasn't what I thought it was, because I've, I've been trying to do some research on, like, military units and military training and things like that for my fantasy series. And I read a book by a guy called Jocko Willink, who's, like, a former Navy SEAL, and he had this book called uh, Discipline Equals Freedom, and it was about how, like, almost the more restricted you are, the more open you can be. It's like a really oxymoronic thing. But, you know, it's this idea that the more restrictions that it forces you to be creative, forces you to innovate. And, yeah, that really resonated with me, that idea. So how are you finding the actual process of getting things done? Because, it's, you know, it's, it's good having the structure and all that. But, I mean, how are you finding the day-to-day, finding time to write, actually getting the work done? Yeah, that's the challenging bit. I find I've got a good space to go and write, actually have a study, which is, has really helped. For me, I find what's challenging is at the moment I've got a temporary promotion at work and I'm basically having sort of crash course training. What they'd usually spread over three months, I'm doing in about three weeks because there's not really anyone on the team. So that's absolutely knackering. And then as well as that, I'm studying for a life coaching qualification and I'm really trying to ramp that up because I want to, to get it done. And also, because I do these things to myself, I also decided to write a book. So I don't <laughs> want any of those things to run, you know, fall off. Um, I think one of my great paranoias in life is I would run out of energy and I would run out of time. So it's trying to balance those things up and figure out, well, they're all important in different ways. The work thing, I can't really do anything about that other than to make sure I'm not taking on more than I have to. So really it's getting that balance between those other big commitments, the coach training and the writing a novel, moving them both forward at a steady pace, really. With your life coaching, what would you advise to someone (laughs) who who had this issue? (laughs) I'd probably ask them what have they tried before that's worked in similar situations and I'd perhaps ask them to prioritise what's most important to them here but probably yeah what's worked for you before when you've been in similar situations and I think what I'd say to that I can think of things that haven't worked before like when I've put a quite strict timetable in place for myself that's not worked I mean you know anyone who's ever done exams and tried to do a revision timetable knows that that can fall apart so I can think of things that haven't worked for me and not do that <laughs> I think what helps, to be honest with me, is keeping my motivations really clear. That sort of helped me. So when, I, when I've been working well these past few weeks, whenever I have been, it's because I've been very clear on why I want to do each thing. So I would probably advise myself to be incredibly clear on what's motivating me to do these things. That bit of advice is really good for writing. <laughs> if you can keep that in mind with your characters of mm. like, what is the motivation? What's the intention? I've almost whittled down my process now to like the idea of obstacle and intention. So what does a character want? What's getting in the way? And just keep ramping that up, ramping that up, ramping that up. That's kind of what's working for me at the minute because I'm writing this ridiculously long series. So. You know, sometimes you'll see the film of a book and it doesn't work at all because they've sort of fiddled around with the character's motivations. I think it's that kind of underlying thing. You can almost do what you like with the setting and how they talk and how they dress, but change what's motivating the character and you've completely bugged up the whole story, really. With you as well, I mean, I know the job you do and it it is an easy job. It's quite stressful. (laughs) 
I suppose it's it's having the headspace, and I don't know what kind of breaks you get at work and things like that. But when I used to work at the Courier, a lot of my breaks, I would take my break, I would go off to the pub, and I would sit and write. 500 words towards my first novel which will never see the light of day i think you've read it actually but you're one of the few people who has had that misfortune but um like finding those little moments finding those little times and just kind of realizing that it's not a sprint you know that you can just kind of slowly hammer away at stuff even if it's uh, 10 minutes here and there there's someone who i can't remember if i refer to in the book but there's someone who i know another author like she's just crazy busy and she managed to write i think it was a 160,000 words last year just doing stuff on a phone in 10 minute slots here and there wow. and that's my wasteland series that's about mm. that length 165,000 words something like that so you know that's a full trilogy yeah. it's that thing of like working out for write 200 words a day what's that going to equal and it's just little things and finding those little moments one reason that can work is, you know, like often we'll, we'll say, uh, I'll do such and such when I just need to find the motivation. But you don't find the motivation. You do something, you drudge along. And somewhere along the way, you get some sort of momentum going. And then it becomes like you get to a point where you're looking back and going, oh, wow, and, you know, three weeks ago I had nothing written and now I've got this. And, yeah. and that's how you gain motivation, I think, is by doing and getting some work under your belt so you can see that you are making progress. So I, can, I think that incremental thing totally makes sense. I find motivation like a bit of a, it's aiming for something else. It, it is like, right, you're not aiming for motivation. It is the, right, how do you write a book? You write a book. You know what I mean? You don't find the motivation to write a book. It's like you're doing something a bit removed if you're doing that. It's just, yeah, it's about the action, isn't it? So yeah, just, just get on with it, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the breaks at work thing could be good because I do get a lot of flexibility around breaks and lunch and everything. I think that could be something I'd, I might experiment with for, say, a week and see how it goes because on the one hand, my head is can end up a total you know, just drained at work. But on the other hand, it would be interesting to see if I'm kind of switching for 10 minutes or half an hour or whatever to writing, does that give my, my head a bit of a break because it's a different type of thinking. It's not just... Uh, slogging through emails and keeping stakeholders happy it's actually something creative to focus on so yeah yeah that would be worth trying it might energize you it's really useful to to track how you're doing with stuff like this and to track how you work best and what works best you know if you're spending 10 minutes on your break and you get five words done and nothing's coming out but then you go home and you can do 200 in that you're just not you know in the right headspace for that at that moment so like actually doing things like tracking stuff that's measurable so this could be stuff like word count or it could be stuff like when you get to the point of like words edited or something you know something like that or if you feel like you've moved progressed significantly in some way then yeah record it you journal don't you do bullet journaling don't you or have you... i do yeah yeah so um, it, might, it might be worth kind of adding that i think so i, I do love uh, a tick list it's like the snowflake method i decided oh, that can be a tick list. So actually I made one um, in PowerPoint because these are the things I do with my life to learn devices. And that's nice, actually, working through the flow chart, ticking it off and seeing that ah, I have made progress because look, I've written a character summary today or I've broken that one sentence down into a paragraph. So, yeah, yeah and I think the bullet journal thing is the perfect place for these sorts of measurables. And I'm willing to bet that if I type bullet journal writing tracking into pinterest it will be overwhelmingly full of entries probably very beautiful the copper plate handwriting There's unrealistic a... <laughs> <laughs> i'm actually in a facebook group for authors who bullet journal so yeah it's it's interesting i would really recommend but you know once you've got to the point where you're ready to do a draft invest in a bit of software i think it's about maybe $35 or something like that. It's really cheap for what it is. It's called Scrivener. And it's a really cool writing software where you can basically set it up like a cork board. And Ooh. I think that would appeal to your the way you do stuff. I think having that, so you can click on a scene and then it's, it opens it like a Word document and you can move them around physically. And I mean, maybe just have a look on like a YouTube demonstration of it and you'll see 
and I think it'll work better than Word for you anyway. That does sound good because it sounds more like um, if you're into mind maps and stuff, that's sort of unfolding. And yeah. I am into mind maps. <laughs> I don't spend all my time mind mapping and doing to-do lists, but probably an unhealthy amount of time. Well, I mean, anything like that, you know, if you can incorporate that into the way you're thinking about stories and there's not one way of doing it, you know, a snowflake method is a way of doing it, but you have to adapt it to your own way of thinking, your own way of working. Yeah, you're the only person who knows himself well enough to know what you need to support yourself, you know. What have you done then so far? Well, looking at my tick list, <laughs> I can tell you, I've done the one sentence summary, expanded that into a paragraph, and now I'm doing character summaries. So I've done one for my main character, and I'm doing a sort of writing a bit of an interview with her at the moment, which I'm finding interesting um, because it's it's affecting a few things in what I had in my head for the story. So that's a positive thing. Um, so I'm doing that. In fact, that's I've got two main characters, but one of them is dead. So that's going to be interesting. <laughs> it's because the story centers around the relationship really between this woman and her relationship with her dead mother. But her mother's kind of a strong presence, really. So even though she's deceased, I'll be writing that sort of that character summary for her as well and, and doing that. And then after that, I want to do sort of little descriptions for some supporting characters. And when all that's done, I'll be sort of then going back to the story and expanding that. Because I think the idea with doing it that way in the snowflake method is your characters will feed into how you end up structuring your story and, and the content of it. it. Makes sense so far, anyway. One thing that might be useful to look at with your coming up with your secondary characters and things is to have a look at something like either Carl Jung's or Joseph Campbell's archetypes. So you're making sure that you get almost like a spread of characters, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. That so, does, yeah. so not all your characters are the same type of character. Because you don't want a story with like, you know, five heroes in. I think sometimes you do, you read books where you feel, you start to feel bad for the protagonist because everyone they come up against seems to be the same. They all seem to be the, the cynical buddy or whatever. And you're yeah. like, oh, come on, give them a break now. Everyone they meet is sort of sarcastic and bitter. <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't seem fair. <laughs> so I like the idea of using the archetypes. I think I've actually got a book on that. Yeah, well, I mean, if you can find any Joseph Campbell stuff, I mean, it's, it's uh, what is it, The Hero with a Thousand Faces uh-huh. is kind of mystical in a way. It's a lot of Jungian stuff and a lot of, well, it's all about, like, the mono myth, which is all these folk stories and myths from around the world and almost uh, the single version of that like all the parallels between them i suppose i'm curious about in you know in your book you mentioned the different fears around that, that get in your way of writing and i know that you write you know you write now as a living and you write regularly do you ever find that those fears ever stand in your way and you have to sort of readdress them every day <laughs> <laughs> yes yes constantly yeah yeah I think this is a thing because it's like when you're in that kind of creative mode, in that zone, it's like, you know, you're opening yourself up to the good stuff and you're also opening yourself up to the barrage of shit. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and it's it's weird. So it's like, you know, I found meditation is actually really helping with that. So I'm trying to do that every every weekday at least because yeah. you know obviously i've got a six-year-old son who wouldn't give me five minutes to meditate so. <laughs> they're not terribly compatible the no. two are <laughs> yeah. but i mean you know i don't know because I know, I know you do reiki and th- i mean do you meditate at all or have you, have you got that um, no and it's almost embarrassing to admit it that i don't i do i do occasionally i go through phases of doing it funnily enough you are not the first person to mention this in the past few days to me so I think there's a bit of a message coming through there that I really do need to just sit and be quiet, which I really struggle with. I mean, I struggle to just sit down yeah. and be still anyway. I tend to jump up and do something. So I can, and I can tell I need to. I, th- I tend to find if I start having really weird allegorical dreams, that's because I'm not get, giving myself time to just think during the day. And it's making my head go a bit odd at night. So um, 
yeah, I think meditation is something I need to have a go at again. I found the Headspace app is really good. It's kind of guided meditations. And I think doing that, especially for the fear stuff, I think my biggest fear is, you know, and I think every every day when I start to write, I feel like there's a bit of a wall. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, <laughs> it's like <laughs> And I've just, I just think, what am I doing? You know, I've done this thousands of times, just whatever. There's that voice still there, just going, John, you crap. John, <laughs> no one wants to read your stuff. John, remember that one star review you got? <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's it just, and it looks for evidence. That voice does. It's very clever. It tries to protect you from potential failure by making you feel like you've failed already. It is like you are putting a part of yourself out there, even if you're writing. Yeah stuff about wyverns and uh, magical blades or whatever it's like there's still a lot of me in their stories i mean god we we, we evolved to be what like on the african plains about ten thousand, hundred thousand years ago or whatever we not evolved for this kind of thing of putting stories out and having them read by people across the world it's crazy i suppose it's natural that we would have these weird fears and resistances and stuff Oh, absolutely. And also, you know, our, our brains, we can't tell the difference inside between a very real threat, like about to be run over by a bus, and the threat of feeling like I might fail at something. As far as your mind's concerned, they're both as terrifying as each other. And it will try and protect you thinking, you know, there's something awful is going to happen. So you kind of, there's always this thing inside where there's the, the bit of you that's sort of conscious enough to know what's going on is saying no. It's fine. I appreciate you worried, but I'm not. If it if it doesn't go right, I won't die. And there's this pacing mad bit inside you that's going, no, but what if? What if? <laughs> and you've got this yeah. constant dialogue where he's trying to reassure, but not push your fears away too much. It's quite. I think it's this fear. It's a delicate balance between keeping it at a safe distance, but also kind of trying to embrace it in a way yeah. as well, yeah. and not be so. I mean, Jung talks about that, the idea of, like, embracing that shadow side of yourself and really push, you know, pushing towards it and, you know, using that. I don't know. There's there's that side of us, isn't there? There's, there's a, there is a dark side to everyone, and this is why people who are really nice, really polite can write a really gruesome murder mystery or something yeah. like that, you know. Come out well. Yeah. It really has. But that's not saying anything about the person who's written it, you know. They, they could just be completely lovely, but they've got this in them as a thing. Like I, I've found with the fear stuff, it's the idea of just working out other fears. And um, I was talking to a guy recently about the idea of kind of getting to your core values, working out what they are and things like that. And I think when you're doing things that go against your core values and things like that, it can have a detrimental effect on you. So it's putting up a even bigger fear than the writing one. So I don't know, for me, like not writing now is more of a fear. Not like not being able to write is actually more daunting now. Because I know, for example, I've got um, the Easter holiday coming up. My wife and my son's holidays aren't meshing so I've basically got, I think it's three weeks off writing and then my sister's coming to stay the week after. So it's really four weeks not writing. And that's really scary. <laughs> like that's, yeah, I can see why. Yeah. <laughs> you've, you've built this quite, you know, you've really built this structure up and this habit and and suddenly it's going to be sort of whipped away for a little while. Yeah. So um, like, because I think the momentum thing is really important and yeah. just kind of doing stuff. So I'm, I'm going to have to find a way, even if it's just to do an hour or something, just to keep up that momentum. So Yeah. You could do the thing of what would you advise someone in, in another situation? Yeah, well, I'd, I'm just going <laughs> to have to uh, have a conversation with my wife and just say, look, uh, I will be <laughs> really antsy <laughs> if I don't get to write for at least an yeah. hour. So. You know, I will be a better person <laughs> to be around. That's a good argument. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure it'll be fine. You know, you know my wife, so she'll she'll get yeah. it. She'll just take my son out to the <laughs> library or whatever. So she's very practical and she's very she's she'll understand that. Have you got any fears that are directly related to the writing then, or? I think many fears that I've had are outweighed for me by the fear of not doing it really 
um, the fear of missing out and of one day looking back and realised, oh, you know what, I tried to do that about 10 times and I never made it work. I never got to the point where I could at least go, oh, well, I tried it, it wasn't for me. I mean, for you know, there's all, there's all the fears like, I'm going to write something that's going to be crap, no one will want to read it, that kind of thing. But I feel like the fear of not doing it and my motivations for doing it are bigger than those fears. Um, you know, because like for, for me, various motivations behind it. One is I want to um, see if I just see if I can do it and see if I can make that voice for myself. Um, another thing is, uh, you know, I'd love for my mum and dad to read something I'd written because it's because of them that I grew up with a love of things like reading and making things and having the belief that you can totally make something, create something from scratch. So I think it would be lovely if I wrote something and they could read it. I think they'd like that. I suppose they're my main motivations, really, and they're sort of enough that it is keeping me fairly focused on what I value about it. For me now, it's more just actually the practicalities of how am I going to fit it in, where am I going to fit it in, and balancing that out, which I'm, I'm going to go away and try for a week, I think, the idea of seeing what happens. If I fit it in here and there in breaks... But I mean, one fear actually we've kind of touched on, which is that fear of being overwhelmed by it. So that's, I think, where potentially meditation or similar comes in to gain that headspace. The thing is, having that awareness of, of yourself and knowing when you are getting to that point, you're not doing this as a business, you're doing this for personal reasons. Yeah. And so the pressure you've got is self imposed. There's no external <laughs> things putting this on you. It's finding the joy in it. You've got, to, you've got to love it because it's torture otherwise. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's torture at the best of times. So from what you just said there, you have put some quite high expectations on yourself. I would say actually you've got a, a quite lofty expectation within yeah, what you just that's, said. That's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> the lofty expectation in it is the idea that you're going to find your voice at this point and the chances are you're not. It's the a journey, voice, isn't it? Yeah, the voice thing is really fucking hard. <laughs> like, mm. I've, I've tried a lot of different voice. You know what I mean? I've, I've tried yeah. to find my voice, and I think that with my writing, I've just got it with the fantasy series that I'm on now. Yeah. Like, I think before that, I've been kind of reaching towards it, and I think some of it was a bit more verbose than it should have been. And I think I've got more of a flow now that feels natural. But it's, you know, it's taken me right in however million words with journalism and then doing fiction writing and you know it's like i don't know it's it's that thing i, I mean I'm, i mentioned it on the podcast though i'm sure i must have mentioned it in the book about the idea of aim to finish something shit aim for your shitty first draft and then you can improve it and you can build on it and i think that's very inspiring actually that's what kind of got me thinking oh you know what? i will give it a go yeah i can, <laughs> I shit. <laughs> I can do that i'm yeah. sure i can do that Part of the motivation for me is that I am at the start of this journey and it's going to take time. So I need to actually do it. Knowing that there's those challenges ahead for me at this point is a motivation because, as I say, I'm always kind of have quite an awareness of time generally ticking away. And I think, well, I can either start now and plod along at it for years and gradually become better at it. Or I can keep waiting, keep waiting, finally have a go when it's too late and not get anywhere. So, yeah. oddly enough, the the difficulty itself is a bit of a motivation. Yeah, <laughs> I may not feel that way in a month or two when I'm. What I would suggest as well is just work on your outline thing. Work on that. Get to a point, and then break off and let the story simmer in your head for a while. Maybe work on some short stories. Maybe do some flash fiction, so stories that are less than a thousand words, just so you can actually work on writing single scenes finding your voice yeah. that way so that when you do start your novel it's not just like wow now i need to learn how to write yeah. and do all the craft things because that's just hard <laughs> it, 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 i mean it's like you know sometimes you read a book and it's amazing and it's made you feel or think in a particular way and you sort of think how on earth did they do that then something so finely crafted it's that's a lifetime thing i think they make it look so easy don't they <laughs> just so smooth it's yeah. uh yeah, trying short stories out, just actually working out how to tell a story and how to find a character's voice and how to make a little story resonate within a thousand words. Like That's a challenge, but it's worth doing as an exercise. 
one thing I did, which, you know, based on what you're saying, probably won't have time to do, but I did a short story a week for a year. I can. <laughs> That's <laughs> and, impressive. Yeah, but I mean, you've, you've read some of them and they're, they're just like, some of them are like a thousand words or 400 words, you know, some of them are really short, but there is a story in them. Don't be discouraged by what I'm saying, by the way. It's not meant to be discouraging. It's just like if you get motivated by doing things like giving yourself goals for writing, make it 50 words in a day, you know what I mean? Make it really low. Then you haven't got that thing of, oh, crap, I've, I've not hit my 5,000 words today. It's like, oh, I wrote 100 words today. That's double my goal. Yay. <laughs> so I don't know, like making little goals for yourself that you can tick off that you've done that are also very achievable i think you're right and that thing does tend to work for me like something i do if i'm studying or writing or anything or, or even writing a job application i'll set a timer for 15 minutes and do that thing where you t- tell yourself like, i won't be distracted i'll just do 15 minutes by which time you're quite engrossed in it and your timer goes and like right i'll focus again for another 15 minutes and you're sort of you're tricking yourself in a way and conning yourself to keep going and i think kind of similar with a word count chances are I would probably write, let's say it was 50 words. That's not going to be all I would want to write. I'd be like, oh, yeah, but I want to continue this or finish this bit. So it's always always leaving yourself wanting more in a way. Well, I mean, 50 words is basically three sentences, isn't it? Yeah, so. it would be a really bad day to not do that. <laughs> really no, I don't don't in, get me wrong, I've been there. but <laughs> Flu or something, I guess. <laughs> if you've got a writing aim and you want to write a novel in a year, then if you do 150 words a day, then you've got a, well, 54,750-word novel. That's not bad. That's really doable. 150 words a day, you know, have that as your aim, and then you know that you'll That's be, beautiful. you'll have a first draft within a year. Yeah, I like that way of looking at it. And I do like that thing uh, you've mentioned before of not rereading till it's done. Because oh. that's very, that's a horrible temptation and everything's just going to sound crap at that point. Yeah, which is why actually, again, Scrivener might be good in terms of, okay, you know those scenes exist. You've got a little, like essentially a corkboard note just saying what's in the scenes, but you don't click on it, you don't look at it until you've done. <laughs> don't look. Um, <laughs> and, it, and it's that interruption thing as well, isn't it? I think is it generally if you're interrupted working on something, it takes about 20 minutes to get back on track, which I can vouch for from work. Yeah. And I guess if you're writing and then you think, oh, I'll just go back and check that paragraph then while you're doing that and then you're distracted and then you're not you've got to get back into it. You're switching your brain, you know, it's like I think the left brain, right brain kind of tasks and it's like you want to stay in the one zone for as long as you can. If you don't look back, just keep going, keep going. <laughs> I think the fact that you motivated enough to consider an outlining method, I think that is really good i think that's going to really help you because i've got several novels that go up to about somewhere between 15 and twenty thousand words that just didn't go anywhere because i ran out of story yeah, that's it isn't it without your outline you kind of might have it in your head oh that's roughly a book's worth yeah actually yeah. no that was that was two chapters mm. <laughs> like being excited because i know that my midpoint's going to have an awesome flip mm. in it and you know knowing that my finale has got this and really want to write about it so it, do, it does drive you and motivate you just to race to it and i think sometimes it uh, if you've done a lot of planning you've taken a lot of uh, basic decisions off your hands by the time you're doing it that can be a really good thing for any big project you know if you've already you've pre-made decisions in a way about the little things so yeah. then you just focus on your bigger decisions and getting those done yeah if you've already done all the, the boring bits yeah, I think it allows you to kind of be more creative on the, you know, on the micro level, if that makes sense. Yeah, you're not there thinking, oh, you know what, should that character be tall or short? <laughs> oh, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> no, but if you've pre-decided it, you don't ever have to think about it again. Anything like that where you have to stop and think, yeah. well, what's this person like? My thing with that now is I will just put a note and just come up with you know i don't want to, i don't even want to think about it i'll just yep. put description here and then i'll carry on because, well I'll, I'll dictate yeah so i don't know if you've got any software like dragon or anything like that but dictating and doing it into a dictaphone or phone kind of device where you're not actually looking at a screen is amazing because you just keep going and you 
don't look back at the story until it's done. So I can see how that would take a big distraction out of the way because I find when I'm typing, I tend to, and I do when I'm handwriting as well, I just miss out letters and things. Mm-hmm. And it drives me nuts, and I can't, I can't resist going and putting the letter in, even though actually it doesn't matter. I'd still know what it means. Yeah. So I can see how, yeah, that dictation thing would really help, because once it's there, it's there. I know people who do things like typing into a letterbox window, so they can't see the line they've oh, just typed. And, that's good. You know, there's things like that you can do. Do you want to plug anything? Have you got any, like, Twitter or anything? Or I have no social media whatsoever. Excellent. I'm deliberately withdrawn from the world, and... As a kind of a card-carrying introvert, it was the best decision I ever made. <laughs> Great. I don't feel bombarded by the world anymore. I can just go out and get the world when I want it. Nothing to plug, but this has been really useful, John, so thank you. No worries, no worries. And, yeah, if you drop me a line when you want to come back on and we'll go through whatever with your story. And, um, Fabulous. So you can check out the Stop Booking Around book. That's on Kindle and audible so feel free to check that out that will support the show if you've got any value from this podcast or anything else that i do you can also check out my patreon so it's patreon.com slash john cruncher author and i post articles and stories and exclusive audio there and you can also get episodes of stop booking around early so please do support me and check that out so until next time cheerio (laughs) 